Um, my name is uh, Mahmoud Bukarmena. I'm a research fellow at the University of Sussex in England. And uh, I'm also a member of uh, the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, which is SONA and uh, Train in Africa. Um, I'm also one of the co-organizers of this webinar series. And today I'm excited to say that we have Professor David Klenerman, who will be giving uh, his presentation. And uh, before I uh, allow him to give his talk, I'll give you a little bit of background about him. So Professor David Klenerman graduated and completed his doctorate at Cambridge University, followed by postdoctoral research at Stanford University, California. He then returned to the UK and worked for seven years for BP research in the laser spectroscopy group before returning to the Department of Chemistry in Cambridge where he progressed to the professorship. He is currently a Royal Society Glaxo Welcome Professor of Molecular Medicine. And Professor Kleinerman is a physical chemist whose research is based on developing and applying a range of new biophysical methods based on laser uh, fluorescence spectroscopy and scanning probe microscopy to tackle problems in biology and biomedical science at the level of individual molecules. This includes studying the molecular basis of adaptive immune response and the role of potent aggregates in the initiation and spreading of neurodegenerative diseases. He co-invented Solexa Next Generation DNA Sequencing with Professor Shankar uh, in Cambridge. And uh, for his discoveries and innovation, he has been elected into many prestigious societies. For example, in 2012, he was elected uh, as a fellow of Royal Society and in 2015 into the Academy of Medical Sciences. In 2018, into, uh, he received a Royal Medal by the Royal Society. And in 2019, he was knighted in the 2019 New Year Honours for services to science and the development of high-speed DNA sequencing technology. So without wasting much time, I'll, um, I'll keep quiet. But just before doing that, I would like to announce that we are now part of the Worldwide Neuro Initiative, which means that we have speaker, we have an uh, audience from around the world. So, David, the stage is yours. Right, thank you very much. Um, so, I was going to talk to you about our work on, on single molecule fluorescence. So, so, what I'm showing here are these little spots, these individual T cell receptors diffusing around on the bottom surface of a T cell. So, in this talk, I'm going to explain to you how we make these measurements and why we would want to make these measurements, and then focus on um, how we can use these, th th these techniques to, to study the molecular basis of neurogenerative disease. So um, the way I've, outlined, um, I've set up this talk, I'm gonna say a little bit about my background uh, and how I progressed um, through, through, through my scientific career. Um, then I'm gonna to explain to you how, how you how we do single molecule fluorescence and a related technique called super-resolution microscopy, then I'm going to give you an example of how we can develop and apply these methods to study protein aggregation and neurodegeneration. And then I'm going to talk about um, probably the best example of, of using these methods, which is the, the uh, next generation DNA sequencing method that I developed with my collaborator, Shankar Balasimamarin. And, and really, the, the key message is these new physical methods can enable new science. And all the way, I guess, through my career, we've just been challenging ourselves with um, trying to tackle more and more really realistic and relevant problems, devising methods um, to try and tackle those. And then once we manage that, moving on to the next step. And as you see, I, I started out doing some very basic science. So this is my, my supervisor, Ian Smith, and I did my PhD in, in 1981. And this is the lab. So this lab has, uh, you can see at the background, a large amount of, of glass um, for gas handling. So I, I made this myself. And then this big um, vessel where, where we undergo uh, gas reactions. So we're going to feed in two gases and they're going to react and produce excited molecules. And they're going to emit um, light in the infrared. And there's an infrared spectrometer here that's going to me measure the the infrared light that's being produced. Um, and, and these reactions are the basis of infrared lasers. And so this is um, the spectrometer that, that was home built that we used to, to measure the infrared radiation produced by, by the molecules. And this is the, the, the large um, 
pumping system that, that was used to, to run these reactions. So this is the first paper that I published on this in 1987 with my supervisor on infrared chemiluminescence using the, this infrared spectrometer. So at the end of my PhD, I'd only published um, a couple of papers. And then I went to Stanford for a couple of years where I worked with, with Dick Zare. So Dick's a, a very well-known um, physical chemist. And in, in the Zare lab at Stanford, I studied um, um, reactions in the gas phase where we tried to excite uh, CH stretch, um, putting in um, visible energy, so excited the fifth overtone of a CH stretch. And the idea was to, to cut an organic molecule at a specific um, position by putting in a light that just excited a particular bond. So that didn't work very well because the energy was very rapidly translated in, into heat. Um, but but that, that was a very interesting time spending working at Stanford. Then I returned to the UK and then I was in the laser spectroscopy group at BP for seven years. So this is me. This is the, the laser lab. So we had a, a lot of complex laser equipment. We, we have the, this um, laser that produces very short pulses of, of infrared light, uh, light, which are doubled to produce this green light, which excites this dye laser. Then the light comes over here where it's amplified to produce very high intensity pulses of picosecond light, which then goes on to the experiment, which is done here. So you might wonder why BP was interested in, in doing this sophisticated laser spectroscopy. And the idea was to study some, some very important processes in the oil industry to, to look at how corrosion inhibitors work by imaging molecules on the surface of, of metals and, and to understand um, how lubricants work. So that's what I worked on for seven years. And then I returned to, to Cambridge. And at that time, I was looking for, for things interesting things to do and 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 it just reached the point where the technology had um, been developed so you could image single molecules so that was one of the things i focused on as soon as i got back to cambridge so i'm now going to explain to you the basis of single molecule fluorescence and super resolution microscopy which is what i've worked on really for the last 20 years um, in Cambridge. So the idea is very simple. You might, if you study chemistry, you might have seen plots like this. We have a, a dye. The, these dyes were largely developed for lasers and have, have very good fluorescent properties. You, you excite them with a laser and then they, they um, come down to their ground state and they fluoresce. And, and if you have a, a, a good dye, a dye-like molecule, you can do this process again and again and again. So you have a single dye molecule, but it can produce millions to 10 millions of, of fluorescent photons. And unfortunately, it undergoes a um, irreversible chemical reaction in its excited state and, and a so-called photo bleaching, then it stops producing photons. But we can get um, one molecule can produce 10 million photons. So it's that large amplification that makes single molecule fluorescence possible. And just to calibrate, you may, maybe many of you are, are well aware of this, you know, so, so th this is the size of the cell, tens of microns, a bacterium, a few microns, a mitochondria, less than a micron. And there's a fundamental limit um, called the diffraction limit, um, which is typically 0.2 microns, 200 nanometers. So any object below this can be detected, but it appears blurred as, an ob as a blurred spot, which is 200 nanometers in diameter. So one of the big advances in my field has been the ability to actually image molecules, uh, image objects which are smaller than the diffraction limit. And this is how you do it. So this is um, uh, a blurry diffraction limited image, but I can organize things so that I just image single molecules as I've just shown you. My, now my single molecule also shows up as a blurred diffraction limit image, but I know there's a, it's, this spot is, comes from one molecule. So the molecule must be at the center of the spot. So I can localize the center of this spot with a higher precision than the diffraction limit. I can replace this blurred spot with, with this much higher pre precision spot. Typically it's about 20 nanometers. And now I have to build up a, an image of my object by localizing single molecules again and again and again. 
So I do this. So I need to work with fixed samples. And in this way, I can build up a, an image of, of my object with about 20 nanometer resolution. So what we do in, in my lab is we built these, we have these home built equipment. So, so we have, um, this is a postdoc Alex, who's building an instrument. These instruments are customized. So we have a bank of lasers, we have a, a inverted microscope, and we have a sensitive camera to detect the fluorescence. It's all very colorful. If we put in a bit of CO2, you can see the, the four different lasers. The lasers are all combined, come over to the microscope. We then excite with um, fluorescence um, our cell in this case, and we have a toll light receptor um, diffusing around on the surface of the T cell, and we label that with an FAB, which has a dye on. And as I, I showed you earlier, we can then watch these molecules diffusing around on the cell surface. And the science we're interested in here is how the, the T cell recognizes um, an invader, um, a virus infection, so sensitively and selectively, and then mounts an immune response. So obviously this is very topical at, at the current time, and it's remarkably sensitive. A, a, a single TCR can, can recognize a, an, an agonist presented by an antigen presenting cell and mount an immune response in a few seconds. So we want to understand the molecular basis of that process. So, so the, the other types of instruments we, we, we built um, allow us to, to um, follow signaling on the cell surface. So instead of coming in from the bottom of the cell, as I've just shown you, we can have a light sheet that comes in a thin sheet across the top surface of the cell. And I'm going to have a nano pipette, a very fine pipette with an opening of only a, a few hundred nanometers. I'm going to hold it um, a few hundred nanometers above the cell. And then when I apply a voltage, I can deliver protein aggregates out of the, the pipette onto the cell surface. And I'm going to do this so I can follow um, the innate immune response that, and the signaling process that occurs when these aggregates arrive on the cell surface. So this is just to show you that I can deliver molecules with very high precision. So I, I'm delivering these little spots of, of, of fluorescently labeled wheat germ. This is real time video on, onto the surface. So I'm now going to deliver wheat germ or gluten. Uh, um, I'm now going to deliver the, these protein aggregates onto the surface of a macrophage. And the macrophage is going to have um, a protein called um, MyD88 tagged with GFP. And that's floating around in the cytosol. But when um, a signaling complex is formed, you'll see these spots forming on the cell surface. So if you look up here, first of all, um, what happens is the aggregates bind toll like receptor 4, and then a signaling complex which involves MyD88 forms at the cell surface. And it, our MyD88 in the cytosol um, forms in this complex. And then if, if we watch the video play back, hopefully. Let me come out. Um, then we, we can um, we can see um, these mitosomes form on the cell surface. So you can see these mitosomes form in real time on the cell surface. So we're watching um, the, the signaling of toll like receptor form in real time on, on the surface of a live cell, watching these individual signaling complexes form. So the other thing we, we can do is, is take these super resolution images of the cell. So this is a T cell. The T cell actually has very fine microvilli, which it uses to sample um, antigen presenting cells uh, and probe and ask, are they presenting virus peptides? But you can't see them in, 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 the, in the white light image. But what we're gonna do is add wheat germ and gluten again, um, and we're gonna build up a super resolution image of the cell surface. So hopefully this plays. So we, we're taking stacks of images, 1.6 million localizations, and then we can build up this very high resolution image of the cell surface. So once we've done that, it should spin around and you should be able to see that there are indeed these fine microvilli 
present on the cell surface. And, and this is just to show you that, but this is a scanning electron micrograph, which has, which has similar structures. So now we, we've got this image of the topography of, of, of the T cell. We can ask, well, these T cell receptors, are they randomly distributed over the cell surface? Or are there more T cell receptors at the tips of these microvilli? So we're going to do the same um, experiment. We're going to build up uh, an image in, in, in green of, of the cell surface. And then we're also going to image the T cell receptor in red. So we're localizing individual T cell receptors on, on, on the surface of this T cell. And then we, we can analyze this data quantitatively. And what we find is, is that the T cell receptor is randomly distributed over the surface of the T cell. It's not localized in the microvilli. Right, so, so the next part of, of the talk, I'm really going to focus on, on the work we've done over the last um, 10 years, um, looking at the molecular basis of neurogenerative disease and trying to, to use the techniques I've shown you and further develop them to address some of the important problems in the field. So as you probably know, small soluble proteins such as tau and, and beta amyloid form aggregates during the development of Alzheimer's disease. So you end up with these extracellular a beta plaques and these intracellular tau tangles. But it's not these insoluble aggregates that are thought to, to cause all the damage. It's thought to be the, the smaller soluble aggregates, which are thought to be toxic by a variety of different mechanisms. So what we, we want to do is develop, develop methods to determine which of all the aggregates um, that are formed are toxic and how are they toxic. And we really focused on trying to study the real species in humans rather than looking at, at animal models or looking at aggregates formed in the test tube. So on, on the more basic side, there's a family of diseases, Alzheimer's disease, um, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, which all end up with the, these um, fibrillar structures being formed, which have a cross beta sheet structure. Um, and so they're very thin, 10 nanometers in diameter and very long. So in Alzheimer's disease, it's amyloid beta, in Parkinson's disease, the protein that aggregates is thynuclein, in Kraschel-Jakob's disease, it's prion protein, in type 2 diabetes, it's amyloid. So it seems to be a very basic process that the, these proteins, most of them which are, are unfolded in their native state under the right conditions, can form the, these fibrillar amyloid fibrils and during that process produce toxic aggregates. So this is the this slide shows you what the problem is. So this slide is actually based on experiments that we did on, on a protein called alpha synuclein, which aggregation causes Parkinson's disease. Um, so so we, we studied this in the test tube using the single molecule techniques I've shown you. And what we found is you start out with monomer. Monomer can combine to produce small dimers and trimers. They, they're globular little aggregates. And then the, these aggregates can undergo a slow structural conversion to a fibrillar aggregate. And once you form this fibrillar aggregate, it can grow by the addition of monum to these large insoluble fibrils. And what we found in, in this paper that we published in Cell in 2012 is that the, these little fibrillar, soluble fibrillar aggregates, so-called protofibrils, were much more toxic than these globular aggregates. Uh, we also found that this conversion step was actually surprisingly slow, and it took 24 hours to convert from these globular aggregates to these fibrillar aggregates. But the important point of, of this slide is there are a wide variety of different species, um, the, these dimers and trimers, all the way up to hundredsmers. And not only that, they, they exist in different structures, globular or fibrillar. And not only that, only 1% of all the protein is aggregates. The other 99% is monomer. So you need these very sensitive single molecule techniques to actually be able to detect these aggregates and characterize their size and structure. So this is what we're doing. You know, the, the, these aggregates are in low concentration and abundance, very heterogeneous in size and structure. So the real problem in the field, there's this concentration gap. The, the real concentration 
in cerebral spinal fluid, for example, of aggregates is picomolar, but people are typically doing experiments at micromolar. There's a reality gap because people often use pure protein and aggregate that in the test tube, but in reality, th these proteins are, are significantly post-translationally modified. And there's a time gap. We do experiments in a few days, um, but it takes decades to develop the disease. So you really want techniques that you can use on the real aggregates that form in, in humans. Like, like I show here, a mouse is certainly not like a human. So this is an experiment that, that we did with one of my um, students, which really changed the, the trajectory of our research. It was one of these experiments you would have thought might not have worked. Um, and we weren't expecting it to work. We just wanted to try it and see, see what might the problems might be. But it actually turned out to work much better than we thought. So there's a dye called thioflavin T. I show the structure here, which is um, angled in its, um, unless it binds to something. So it doesn't bind to the monomer and it's very non fluorescent. But if you take it, um, provide beta sheet containing aggregates, the, the, the dye becomes planar. It intercalates inside the beta sheet, and becomes highly fluorescent. And this is commonly used to detect, um, to follow the, the aggregation process in the test tube. So what one of my students, Matthew Horrocks, did is we got some cerebral spinal fluid from our collaborators at University College London who work on Parkinson's disease. We took the cerebral spinal fluid, diluted it tenfold, and added um, a few micromoles of, of thioflavin T, and put it on one of our sensitive microscopes and, under, and it underwent this total internal reflection. And what we saw in the image were the, these small bright spots. These bright spots are diffraction limited. So whatever we're seeing, these, and we think we're, we're seeing beta sheet containing aggregates are, are smaller than the diffraction limit. So this was very exciting. We could actually detect that the real aggregates that are present in the cerebral spinal fluid of a patient, unfortunate enough to have Parkinson's disease. And it raised all sorts of questions. What are these aggregates? Are these aggregates made out of alpha-synuclein? Are there more aggregates in a person with Parkinson's disease than a control? Are they bigger aggregates or are they more, um, more fibrillar aggregates? And this is the basis of a, a lot of the work we've done over the past few years. So, so our approach to this problem now is we've developed these quantitative methods to detect and characterize individual unlabeled aggregates, the aggregates that we can get out of humans to try and understand the mechanism of neurodegenerative disease. So we can measure the number, we can measure their size, as I'll show you using super resolution microscopy. We can say something about their structure, and, and we do this by looking at the accessibility of certain epitopes to antibodies. We've got two um, assays that we can use to measure their toxicity, which I'll show you in the next few slides. We can measure how easy it is to degrade the, these aggregates if they're um, very resistant to, to degradation, um, they, they presumably stay in the body for longer and cause more damage. And as I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, we also can measure their ability to seed aggregation and, and um, grow by addition of monomer, then break up produce two aggregates. So this slide shows you some of our um, methods. Um, unfortunately, that seemed to be missing with this link. Um, so it, it, if this played, what you'll see is the intensity disappeared over time. This is a, a time trace um, showing you that the intensity is bright and then disappears over time as these aggregates are degraded by proteinase K. This video, which is playing, you, you can see that, that the spots get brighter over time. So we put aggregates on the surface, and what happens is, is they grow by addition of monomer over time. And what we have here is murine prion protein, and this is a, a speeded up video, but you can see that it grows and then it breaks into two aggregates. And this is supposed to be the, the, the basis of prion-like spreading, where one aggregate can, can grow and break into two aggregates and in this way. Um, increase in number exponentially and spread through the brain. So I'm now going to talk you through just, just one example of our recent work wh where we studied the cerebral spinal fluid of patients who had Alzheimer's disease. So we had control patients. Um, um, these are all 70-year-olds from Sweden. 
we had control, we had patients who were so-called mild cognitively impaired, which is the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, and then we had um, patients who had full-blown Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to run, run their cerebral spinal fluid through a bunch of assays. So the first assay we used, I show up here, and we add the, the aggregates in the CSF to, to, to a, a, a large number of liposomes arrayed on, on the surface. And the, these liposomes contain a dye that binds calcium. So what can happen is the aggregates in the sample can make a punch a little hole just for a short length of time in the bilayer. If they do that, calcium in the bath can enter the liposome. And because there's a, a calcium bind, the liposome, liposome lights up. And how much it lights up depends on how many of these uh, membrane permalizing aggregates are present in our sample. And we do this on thousands of liposomes at the same time. We actually designed this so it's so sensitive, we can detect a single calcium ion entering one of these liposomes. So if we do the experiment with the CSF, this is what we see. We get this, this um, level for the control CSF, we get a, a much more raised level for the MCI CSF, but we see the same low level for the Alzheimer's disease CSF. So it looks like these mild cognitively impaired patients have had some sort of aggregate present in their CSF, which is more effective at permalizing the membrane. On the other hand, we have another assay where we add the, the CSF um, to BV2 microglial, and over time, these secrete TNF alpha. So if we do that experiment, we, this, we see an increase over several days. This is the basal level from the control. This is the level for the MCI CSF, and you can see it, it's very similar. But in this case, the Alzheimer's disease CSF give us a much higher level of production of TNF alpha. So what this means is when these people have gone on to develop full-blown Alzheimer's disease, um, the aggregates that are driving the process seem to have changed and become more inflammatory. And we know that this is um, due to the aggregates, because if we do a blocking experiment, if we add an N-terminally binding antibody to A-beta, you can see that the amount of TNF alpha goes down. But if we add a C-terminally binding antibody, it doesn't go down. And this tells us that the aggregates that are causing um, the inflammation are A-beta containing, and they're fibrillar because the C-terminus is not accessible once you form fibrillar aggregates. In contrast, if we take the MCI CSF and do the same experiment with antibodies, both the N and C terminally binding antibody are equally good at blocking um, the calcium influx, suggesting that they're, they're structurally different, and both the N and C terminus of the, uh, of, of the protein is accessible in this case. But in both cases, the, 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 the calcium influx and TNF alpha production are produced by A beta aggregates. Um, and the, the infl inflammatory response that we see, um, we can add an antagonist to um, a receptor called Tolite receptor 4, which is the same receptor I told you a little bit about at the start of the talk. And this antagonist, RSLA or TAC242, reduces the amount of TNF alpha that we observe. So the signaling that, that we observe is by this receptor, Tolite receptor 4. So what we're going to do now is try and correlate the, 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 these differences in toxicity that I've just shown you with this number and, and size of the aggregates present. So we used a, a form of super resolution, which is based on an atom of DNA. So an atom is a short sequence of DNA that's been designed to recognize a particular substrate. In our case, it was evolved to bind fibrillar A-beta or fibrillar synuclein. So if we ha what we did is take this aptima, it's a published sequence, and extended the, the, the sequence to have this green docking strand. So we lob in our, we um, capture aggregates on a, on a glass surface, lob in the aptima, which um, binds to the aggregates, and then we have a imaging strand, which is a complementary strand to the docking strand, which has a fluorophore attached. So the, when this imaging strand hybridizes to the docking strand, we see a bright spot, we can localize that, and then it unbinds, and we can't see it, and then it rebinds again. And, and in this way, we can build up a super resolution image of our aggregate. So this is an example. This, this, these are synthetic aggregates of alpha synuclein. 
This is the diffraction limited image of an oligomer, and this is a super resolution image. This is the fibril. You, you can't really see much of the structure. This is our super resolution image. So in this case, our, our resolution is about 20 nanometers. And the same thing works for, for A beta. So what we do is take the CSF, absorb all the aggregates onto the surface and image them using this technique. And what we found was very interesting. We saw no difference in the number of aggregates between the control, the MCI, or the Alzheimer's disease. But what we did find was a, a difference in their size distribution. So this is the plot of, of, the, of the size of the aggregates. Um, um, this is a cumulative frequency plot. So, so um, up here, this point, half the aggregates are, are shorter than about 50 nanometers. So the way to interpret this plot is if it goes up very slowly, I have a high proportion of longer aggregates, and if it goes up very sharply, I have a high proportion of small aggregates. And just to note this scale, we saw aggregates all the way out from 20 nanometers, which is our, our limit of our resolution, all the way out to 200 nanometers. So there's some very large aggregates present in the CSF. And hopefully you can see just by eye, the Alzheimer's disease CSF um, plot goes up more slowly than the control and MCI CSF, showing we've got a higher proportion of, of longer aggregates in the Alzheimer's disease CSF. There's actually a statistically significant difference between the MCI CSF and the control CSF, with the MCI CSF having a higher proportion of smaller aggregates. So we then confirmed this result using atomic force microscopy. So here we absorb the, the aggregates onto a surface. In this case, it's very flat. It's a mica surface. And we have to do these experiments in air. So if we start up here, you can immediately see by eye that the control CSF has these very small spots. And, and the brightness in, in these plots, um, it's bright as it comes up a, a bigger distance above the mica. Um, the MCI CSF, you can see the spots are, are, are a little bit longer and, and you, a little bit brighter. And the Alzheimer's disease, even longer and even brighter. So if you come down here, so this is a 50 nanometer scale bar. You see the, all these little globular aggregates in the control CSF. Here you, you, you see the, these longer aggregates, which are brighter in the MCI CSF and even longer and brighter in the Alzheimer's disease CSF. So this is a um, quantification of that data. The MCI CSF only comes up half a nanometer above the mica, but the Alzheimer's disease CSF, the aggregates come up a couple of nanometers above the mica. This is the length. The length of the control um, CSF is down here, um, about 70 nanometers. The MCI is higher, raised, and it's even more raised for the Alzheimer's disease CSF. So we're seeing that the, these, these fibrillar aggregates forming in the Alzheimer's disease CSF. Uh, and we're going to call these protofibrils, but they're not, not like full fibrils, which have a much bigger diameter. So what we think is happening um, um, and, and, uh, in terms of, of, of why, why the, 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 these aggregates are, are good at causing inflammation. So there's no crystal structure of toll-like receptor 4 binding to these aggregates. But there's a crystal structure of toll-like receptor 3 binding to double-stranded RNA. And what you have is, is um, the toll-like receptor 3 binding hand over hand over the, the double-stranded RNA. The double-stranded RNA is, is 2 nanometers in diameter. Uh, and so you could just imagine um, one of our aggregates being bound by toll-like receptor 4 in a similar fashion. What, what these studies showed is that the double-stranded RNA needed to be longer than 15 nanometers in order to get these two toll-like receptor threes rounded. But we've now got the, these protofibrils that are hundreds of nanometers. So you can imagine we can get several toll-like receptor fours um, binding at the same time along the length of, of, of the, the protofibril so that we, we think that the, these protofibrils might be very, um, might be super agonist because multiple toll-like receptor fours combined to them. So just to summarize this part of the talk, what I've shown you is the monomer uh, can form these small aggregates that are good at punching holes in membranes, and then they go on to form these protofibrils, which, as I've shown you, are much better at causing inflammation 
by toll-like receptor 4. So as the disease progresses, the aggregates increase in size um, and, and the mechanism of, of damage changes. Early on, it, the, the, they're causing calcium influx. Later on, they're causing inflammation by toll-like receptor 4. And we've got a drug development program aimed at, at de devising antagonists to toll-like receptor 4 as a potential therapy for Alzheimer's disease. The other very interesting thing ab about these diseases is that the aggregates um, propagate through the brain in a very characteristic pattern. So this is the, the, the pattern for A beta. So this is uh, over various different stages, so-called BRAC stages, which take decades. This is the, the pattern for tau. So you can see uh, different from, from A beta, and this is the pattern for alpha synuclein. But these um, proteins, um, the aggregate um, propagates through the brain or appear to propagate through the brain over time in a very characteristic fashion. So at the molecular level, what's thought to happen is that the protein exists in its physiological form. But if I add a, a fibrillar aggregate, um, a so-called pathological seed in, in this, this figure, um, the, 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 the monomer can add to the fibrillar seed, it will grow, and then it can fragment and break into two daughter fragments and one of these can go off to another cell uh, and, and the same process can occur so we're going to if this happens we're going to get exponential increase in the number of aggregates and they're going to spread through the brain from neuron to neuron and increase in number exponentially so this is what what one would think happens you, you form a fibril it elongates and breaks the daughter aggregates go go, go into daughter cells they, they grow and, and fragment. And so, and you get this exponential increase in the number of aggregates. And you only need 22 rounds of, of amplification in order to, to get um, an aggregate in every neuron in a mouse brain, or you need 37 rounds of, of doubling to get a seed in every neuron in the human brain. So the real question is, do, does this actually take place? And is this driving the real disease in humans. Um, so, so we've done some experiments with Will McEwen at the Dementia Research Institute. So Will has a model where he has these hex cells that express a mutant form of tau, P, which is P301S, labeled with venous. And if you add tau fibrils, um, the fibril enters the cell and seeds and you can detect aggregation. And so we have an ongoing project. I just wanted to give you a sense of it, where we're watching that this process, we're taking snapshots of this process and using super resolution to see exactly what, what's going on. So this is a diffraction limited image of tau in a cell, in a hex cell. And tau is a microtubule binding protein. So you can see um, it's, it, it, it's all on the microtubules. This is our super resolution image, and hopefully you can appreciate we get much higher resolution of the microtubule network in this cell. Now, if we add a seed, this is what happens. Um, we see all these small aggregates forming um, quite rapidly. So we can then follow this, and this is just to show you that, that there are indeed these very small aggregates formed that are below the diffraction limit. Here's another example. And this just shows you can't actually see them in the diffraction limited image, but you can see them in the super resolution image. So what we can do is follow over time um, this process. We see very little before we add the seeds. Within seven and a half hours, we see formation of, of these fibril aggregates. And after 24 hours, a large number. So we, we're following this process and we're trying to quantify it in order to predict whether prion-like spreading really occurs in the human disease. And just to summarize this part of the talk, I've shown you that we're imaging that the aggregates, the real aggregates from humans associated with the disease. We're finding out how they initially damage neuronal cells. We find that, that inflammation plays an important role in this process. We hope that our methods have potential for early diagnosis because we can detect these aggregates in cerebral spinal fluid. We can also detect them in serum and we might be able to monitor the effectiveness of therapies and seeing if they reduce the amount of these toxic aggregates. And we hope this will provide the basis for rational design of new therapies. Like I mentioned, 
we see inflammation driven by toll-like receptor 4 as being an early, very early event and been screening a large number of molecules to find um, a potential small molecule that could be used for, for this. And we ha actually have some, some molecules which are lone nanomolar binders that we're hoping to, to test in animals very soon. So the last part of my, my talk is, is probably my best example to show you that physical methods are, are very empowering. Uh, and this is one of the, the first things that I, I did when, when I came back to Cambridge. So at the time, um, there was a big drive to, to be able to sequence uh, the genome of an individual. So why would you want to do that? So people wanted to do this to understand the difference between humans and find the cause and hopefully the cures for, for common diseases. And there's this idea that if you had someone sequence, you know what disease they were predisposed to get and you could take preventative measures, screening methods, treatment methods to, to actually stop them getting the disease. So the challenge is there's 3 billion bases um, in each cell and we differ, uh, each individual differs by one in a thousand bases. And, and what's really needed is, is a process that can sequence DNA cheaply for about a thousand dollars and rapidly in, in about a day. So that was a challenge that, that we were thrown at the time. So um, this was work that, that I did initially with, with Shankin, in the Department of Chemistry, and we founded a, a spin-out company called Selexa. So this is sort of a play on, on words, single molecule. Shankar thought any decent company should have an X in it. This is our symbol. This is a, a hairpin of DNA with a fluorform. And so this company did its initial work in the department and then moved to, to a science park just outside Cambridge and then was taken over by Illumina who continued to develop the technology and sell the instruments. So this is how um, DNA sequencing was done at the time. It's based on a method developed by Fred Sanger, which I'm sure you're well aware of. And basically you have a template prime of DNA and you have a polymerase which copies th this DNA and you have um, bases, normal bases, and terminator bases, and you copy the DNA, and if you incorporate a, termin a terminator base, um, you can't incorporate any more nucleotides. And these are labeled either radioactively or with fluorophores. Then you have the, this nested um, fragments of DNA, and you run them down a gel. The small ones come out fast, uh, first, and, and the, the long ones come out last and you measure the color of the terminated base and you can work out the sequence of the DNA. So, so what we were interested in was exploiting single molecule fluorescence. Most of the experiments before the development of single molecule fluorescence were literally done on billions of molecules at a time. And then the science advanced so you could detect one molecule with multiple fluorophores on and then in the mid 90s, you could detect a single fluorophore. And this opened up the, the opportunity of analyzing molecules one by one, like I've shown you how we've done for protein aggregates, and also represented the ultimate in miniaturization if you're just studying single molecules. So in 1995, we wrote a grant to the BBSRC, and this was the, the, the idea of the grant. We'll have a template primer of DNA attached to a surface, and we'll have a fluorophore attached to the DNA, and we'll have a fluorophore attached to the polymerase. And we put in nucleotides and polymerase would, would bind to the template primer, put in the complementary base and, and spiral up the DNA. And we'd watch the polymerase putting these bases in real time because the, the, the fluorophore and the polymerase would undergo a, a process called fluorescent resin energy transfer with the fluorophore and the DNA. So if they're close, we get a lot of transfer, and if they're far away, we get a small amount of transfer. So by measuring the amount of threat, we, we could monitor the relative distance between the, the polymerase and the fluorophore and the DNA. So we expected that the, the threat signal to decay exponentially, but, but it would also be sinusoidal because of the helical structure of, of the DNA. So this is an experiment we could never get to work, but during this process, we, we devised it this way um, for very rapidly sequencing DNA. So this is um, Colin Barnes and this is Mark Osborne. 
who some of you as um, Sussex might know, um, who were the postdocs who worked on the project. So this is um, Shankar, this is me um, back in 1997, um, having a drink in our local pub, which is a short walk from the chemistry department. And this is the idea we came up with. We have our template prime of DNA. We have um, color coded bases, C, G, A, and T. And these bases are engineered so that we can only put one base in. The blocks, just like the, the bases that Fred Sanger used, but unlike his bases, they're reversibly blocked. So we can. So what we're going to do is, is, is our polymerase is going to add the complementary base, but no other bases are going to be added. We can then read what the color is. We can then unblock the, the, the base, so it will undergo another cycle of, of um, addition, and, and um, we'll remove the, the fluorophore tag, and then we'll repeat this process again and again. And that way we can build up the sequence of the DNA. So this is the nucleotide that Shankar devised with a, a cleavable linker for the fluorophore and a reversible terminator. So the idea is we extract the human DNA, we fragment it and attach it to a surface. These um, fragmented pieces of DNA just need to be about a micron apart so we can resolve them. And each one of these is effectively a sequencing layer. So we've got, got this massively parallel array of sequencing lanes. And this is the calculation that I did back in 1997. So we have 3 billion bases. We're assuming a 300 by 300 array. And we assume it takes 10 seconds for each imaging cycle. So if you work that out, we can do 10 to the 4 bases per second. And so it would take us um, 100 hours or 5 days to sequence a human genome. And so this seemed to us to open up the possibility of sequencing human genomes in reasonable lengths of time. And, I, and as you know, um, probably know, it, this turned out to be right. And actually, the technology wor works better than this simple calculation. Um, so this was a proof statement that, that we, we, we did um, very early on just to show um, the funders that we could actually detect single molecules. So as I told you, um, you can cycle the floor for again and again and again, and then it ultimately undergoes photo bleaching. So we can use this to check that we've got a single molecule. We expect that the fluorescence to, to be continuous, and then the, the molecule will undergo irreversible photo bleaching. If we happen to have um, two molecules not touching, but together in a diffraction limited spot, then we expect to see two steps in the photo bleaching. And very rarely we observe um, three steps in the photo bleaching show that they have three molecules. So this is a very grainy video that the technology has improved. Um, if you keep an eye on this spot, you, you'll see the intensity goes down to one and then goes to zero. So this was one of the early things that they wanted um, us to do to show that we could detect single molecules. This is now, as I've shown in, in the talk, a very standard technique. This one is still one. It's hopefully about to photo bleach. Okay. So, so the, the company essentially did exactly what I just outlined with one important difference. Um, it turned out that that to simplify the instrumentation and to get around with uh, with non-specific binding issues, that that they amplified the DNA. So, what you do is take take the DNA uh, and you put these adapters on it, and it, you. It undergoes this, this surface-based amplification, which is shown in the, this cartoon, and you convert one molecule into a little cluster of 100 molecules with the same sequence. And then what you do is exactly what I've described, put in your color-coded bases, excite with a laser, detect the fluorescence, unblock, and repeat the cycle. And you only need to determine um, the sequence of, of 25 bases to be able to uniquely map it back onto the human genome. And we've got millions of these fragments of DNA all over our surface. So this is what it looks like. Um, the, the, these random spots, each color representing the, the, the base that's been incorporated at that cycle is shown here. So um, this is our first instrument that, that was um, um, sold in, in 2006, 
And this is uh, one of the more recent instruments that's capable of a trillion basis per run. So 1997, um, before we started, um, you could do about 10 to the 5 basis per instrument. In 2005, you can do 10 to the 12 basis per instrument. So this is an improvement of, of a factor of 10 to the 7. The number of sequencing lanes was 100. It's then up to, to a billion, and again, an improvement of 10 to 7. And probably the most important thing was the cost, which went down from a, a billion dollars, so it's about a dollar per base, down to a um, thousand dollars. So um, a large number of different animals have, have been sequenced using this, this method. So in 2001, um, the, the average sequence, this is the consensus sequence of every um, average sequence of, of, of a human being was published in this, this issue of Nature. And in 2008, we used our technology to sequence uh, an individual Afro-American. And, and this opens up the idea of personalized genetics and medicine. So the, the, in, in England, the NHS um, is using this, this method. We, we're sequencing 100,000 people to see, look at their, their genetics and how that, that um, alters uh, what diseases they end up developing and relate that back to, to, to their genome. We're also um, looking at children who, who have um, rare diseases because often if you sequence them, um, some of these rare diseases, um, I think it's about 30% of the cases, there's actually a drug that can be used to, to cure, cure the newborn infant. Um, so this, this slide, um, the next slide I, I want to show, particularly for the young people in the audience, to give you an idea of, of, of the trajectory of, of the company. And, and the my, main idea is to give you the sense that we literally started with a piece of paper which had my calculation on in 1997 and just how fast um, you can develop this technology. So this is 1995 ideas and proof of concepts in Cambridge. And in 1998, we, we founded this company, Selexa, with a, s a relatively small amount of money. Um, this is an amount of money that you can easily get from a research council to do some of the advanced proof of concept show that we can image single molecules. In 2000, we got another chance of money, one and a half million. Again, this is the type of money that, the, that you can get from a research council. In 2001, we've now got 12 million from, from a bunch of um, venture capitalists, Abingworth, Oxford Biosciences, Schroeder and Amadeus. So this is the type of money that you, you can't really get from research councils. 2000, and, and three that the, the draft human genomes um, published. Then we got another eight million from the existing venture capitalists. Um, in 2005, we, we listed on the NASDAQ and we got 50 million. So hopefully you're getting a sense of the amount of money coming into the companies in, increasing in an exponential fashion. Um, we, we had over hundred pe people working at the company and in 2006, we, we launched our first commercial system and sequenced a chromosome. So we've now gone in 10 years from an idea on a piece of paper to, to an instrument. So this instrument was acquired by, by, company was acquired by Illumina for $600 million. So at this point, the, the venture capitalists have put in $170 million and, and, the, and it was being sold for $600 million. And then Illumina um, did an excellent job improving the engineering um, um, and the technology improved. And so currently there are over 2000 instruments um, which are used all over the world for, for sequencing. And, and you can do a human genome in a day um, for $1,000. So really I just challenge you, if, if, if anyone out there has a exciting idea, um, I think, you only get these opportunities once or, or twice in your lifetime. Recognize you've got an opportunity and, and see how far you could get. We never really thought we would actually end up with an instrument that was going to be used widely. We just wanted to see what was possible. And, and um, you just don't know unless you try. So I would just urge anyone who thinks they've, they've got something that might have some impact to certainly explore its potential. I'd just like to thank my group. This is us on our group retreat. Hopefully um, things will calm down and we'll be able to go back to France. So this is Mont Blanc in, in the background here. 
and just acknowledge all my co-workers, Matthew Horrocks, who's now up in Edinburgh, um, and, and Simon Day, who developed the liposome assay, and, and a, a bunch of, of long-term collaborators in Cambridge and, and other places who, who really helped support this work over the years. And I'll stop sharing this screen now and happily answer any questions that you have. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, David, for, <clears throat> for a very um, inspiring talk. Uh, I think now we have a few minutes for questions. And uh, before we get the questions from the audience, I think I would ask you the first question. So I was wondering, what do you think about um, the, is there, is there any idea about the post translational modifications on the A beta you get, is there any post translational modification on the CSF A beta? And do you yeah. think that would be, yeah. So, so I didn't show you, we, we've actually extended the method. So, so what we can do now is have a capture antibody on the surface we capture the aggregate and we sandwich it with the second antibody that has a fluorophore. Mm. And so we can ask um, if we have an antibody to a particular post-translational modification, is that present or not mm. present? So we can start to explore the, those types of, of, of questions. So we've just got this working and we've modified it so that we can also measure the size of the aggregates as well. So, so we're, we're poised to be able to do these experiments, but we haven't done them yet. And frustratingly, we had this all working, and then we were shut out of our labs. Otherwise, we'll be doing them now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so it seems like we haven't got many questions. Uh, uh, so I'll probably ask the next question again. Okay. Uh, so I was thinking, in terms of your career, because a lot of us are young, uh, car, you know, scientists wanting to, you know, progress in our career what inspired you into what you're doing because you did clearly show us how you started with an idea and everything what inspired you and what kept you going so, so i think we were driven by um not just develop i mean we come at it from a, a method development sort of approach so what we wanted to do was develop useful methods so we, we tried to develop methods that if they work, they'd solve an important problem. And so, and if they didn't work, then at least we, we, we wanted to find out why they didn't work and, and work on fixing that. And so we've always tried to, to push ourselves to, to work on what we think are significant problems. Uh, where we get those problems are, are, are from seeing what other people are doing and by developing collaborations. And, and, and that's, but, but that approach it works in, in the sense that if you can get the method to work, you immediately got a range of problems that you can tackle. In, in my field, people develop methods, and then they hunt around to see what problem they can apply it to. And you can end up with a, a very nice method, but very few applications. And, and we've just stretched ourselves. So the CSF example, I mean, I actually didn't think that was going to work, but I thought, let's try it, you know. Mm -hmm. In the worst case, the experiment might not work and we'll discover what the problems are in doing CSF. But it was a reverse. Suddenly we thought, well, CSF, it's not very fluorescent. We, we thought it would be very fluorescent. We wouldn't be able to see anything. It's not very fluorescent. Wow, we, we, we don't have to work with these mouse models. We can study um, the aggregates directly in humans. So for, for, for us, that was a big advance. And it meant um, there were very few people with our capabilities. So, mm -hmm. so we... We, we really pushed on um, basically pioneering that. So I think it's it's just, you know, we call them Friday afternoon experiments where, where we would go and do something a bit wacky just to see if it might work. Because it might not be as hard as, as you think. And multiple times in my career, um, we, we tried the hard experiment, not, not building up to it, just tried the hard experiment to see how hard it actually is only to discover it's not actually as hard as we thought it was. Fantastic. Um, but I guess we, you know, we just haven't, uh, so I, I would, my, I guess my advice is to do something that's interesting and, and, and potentially important. And, and it's tough because you get your grants rejected, you get your papers rejected. Um, but if you keep going, you, 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 you know, um, you can merge at the other side. And once you've, 
gone through this loop a few times, it, it always seems quite desperate. But, but the last grant you write, when you really need it, you get it. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it does force you to, to think quite hard about what you're doing and what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not easy, but it's very rewarding. But you, mm -hmm. you're going to take two steps forward and one step backwards. So you'll just have to get used to that. <laughs> if you want yeah. to go steam ahead, you should not be a scientist. Absolutely. So, David, uh, uh, do you have a couple of extra minutes just to take a few questions from the audience? Maybe five minutes. Do you have five extra minutes? Yeah, sure. No problem. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for the audience, uh, my sincere apologies for those of you who I can't read their questions. I'm only going to take the ones that are relevant. So this question said, uh, nice lecture. Can we apply the molecular aggregation as I guess, for serum analysis? Yes, so we're, we're, we're doing that. Again, frustratingly, we, we had some nice data from Parkinson's disease serum where we actually saw, saw um, clear differences between the aggregates between PD patients and controls. Um, mm. we, we saw bigger aggregates in the PD patients, so we're very excited about that as a potential um, diagnostic test for um, Parkinson's disease. So it's absolutely, it works with serum. Again, we didn't think it would, but we tried it and, and it, it worked, surprised it worked. That's really great, especially with the recent findings that you can uh, use some markers from the serum for, uh, for biomarker. Yeah, so um, I think serum is very exciting and very accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so there's this question from James Queen. Hello, James. So he said, great presentation for the CSF seed in RC. You use A beta antibody to stop induction of inflammatory response. Have you tried tau antibodies? Maybe also other tau antibodies too instead of AD. So we can do this, but but we haven't done it. So 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 um, we, we're very keen to study tauopathies because so the problem with Alzheimer's disease is you have amyloid beta deposits, and, and then you have tau, and then like, like the question is saying, you've got A beta and tau mm -hmm. that potentially can, can be causing. Um, damage. Um, so, so we're very keen. We've got a program on, on tauopathies, but, which is just starting, but we haven't um, we haven't got any data. But but our techniques are, are generic. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we feel we, we 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 can we can now in a position with these capture antibodies to identify A beta antibodies, tau anti um, A beta aggregates, tau aggregates, uh, and um, and work out um, what these aggregates are doing and which are driving the disease. So, so yes, okay. it's work in progress. Fantastic. Uh, and we've got this question from Sarah. So she said, have you isolated a particular subset of oligomers which induce a such a toxic response? Have you determined any characteristics other than size of this species if you have? Um, so so um, it's not just size. We think it's these protofibrils, so these long, thin aggregates that, that are inflammatory. So, so but the way we've um, done it was we've made synthetic aggregates and, and, and separated them using a sucrose gradient. And then we, we can try and relate um, the toxicity properties to, to the, the size and structure properties. So we've done those experiments for A beta and we're doing those for synuclein. We haven't done them for the brain derived aggregates because we simply don't have enough aggregates, but, but, but that does work and you can isolate would enrich aggregates with certain properties and then ask what, what, are, what, are, their, what are their size and what are their structure. So, so the sucrose gradient is one way to do that. Okay. But it enriches, it doesn't, you don't end up with pure anything. Mm. I, I think this is a problem. As soon as you try to purify these things, they readjust to equilibrium and, and, and they very quickly dissociate and be, a big aggregate will then dissociate into smaller aggregates and monomer. So, so, it's not, so enrichment works, but, but really um, separating them is quite challenging, I think. I see, I see. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll probably take one question or two, depending on your time. I would say no, one. Sorry, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. So, uh, so Craig said, great, thank you. You described a model of secondary nucleation. What is your opinion on how the initial aggregation forms? So, so, we, sorry. so we think, you know, there's some, for some reason there's disruption to, to protein homeostasis, um, which le leads to, to, to 
accumulation of, of, of these aggregates and particularly conversion into these more fibular aggregates. We, we think that that's inflammatory driven. So, so certainly we've done a very nice experiment where we've just taken cells and exposed them to TNF alpha. So the cells without TNF alpha are happily maintaining protein homeostasis and then no detectable aggregates. As soon as we, we add TNF alpha, um, we can induce aggregates. So we think it, inflammation is one of the early events. These cells then secrete aggregates, which drive more inflammation, and, and, they, and, and this drives the disease. So, so the way that this works is the neurons produce the aggregates, the secreted aggregates cause inflammation in microglial and astrocytes, they secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause more inflammation in the neurons. So you have this positive cycle of protein aggregation and inflammation. So that could be started by inflammation, which we think is sporadic disease, or it could be started by aggregation, which would be familial disease where you have an aggregation prone protein produced in the neuron. I see. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of questions, but uh, because we want to, as much as possible, kind of get the questions to be more, more relevant to the talk, I'll probably not be able to read those questions. So my sincere apologies for everyone who sent their questions. I think uh, with this, we've spent over an hour. Uh, I'll probably just say we should call it a day. So um, on behalf of the um, Secretary General of the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, Professor Amadio, uh, I would like to say thank you for sparing your time to give this amazing presentation. And as well, obviously, the members of SONA and uh, all our audience from all across the world. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, David. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.